Welcome to a shiur on Yetziat Mitzrayim and the Haggadah Shel Pesach. As you can see, this lecture is all online on my website, tefillah.org. There are lectures in Hebrew and in English. And the goal of this uh, shiur is to give an introduction to Yetziat Mitzrayim. I'm trying to show interesting aspects. I follow the idea of the Mishnah, Ben Chamesh Le Mikra, Ben Esa Le Mishnah, Ben Chamesh Esra Le Talmud, in a systematic manner from the Bible to the Mishnah and the Gemara. But as an introductory course to, the, uh, to all these topics, I would like to start with an overview on Egyptology and the exodus of Egypt. There is a lot to learn, not only from the Bible, the Mishnah and the Gemara, how the Haggadah was shaped and was created. There is actually a lot that we should go back to Egypt and to learn what is the culture, what's the historical background, what is the belief system in Egypt, the religious understanding that Bnei Israel were facing when they lived in Egypt. And the Torah, actually, before we talk what the Torah says, the Torah faces this culture and responds to these uh, Egyptian culture. I think that is a fascinating field to explore. And you will find a lot of material and all, all the other topics by these uh, 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 generations of Mikra, Mishnah, and Talmud later on. What I would like to show now in this introductory lecture, which is extremely historical, very authentic, and most parashanim do not focus what was really the history in Egypt and what was the culture that Bnei Israel had to live with. I think by doing so as an introduction, we can learn a lot. Let me take it to a further, to a further level. I think that uh, the, the challenge to learn from the Bible, the Tanakh, and the, the Egyptian culture is a very, very special encounter to integrate what can we learn from these two different worlds. There are two different worlds, but the connection between them, the similarity or the differences are actually the most interesting message, I believe, to learn more about Yetziat Mitzrayim. And I see that as a very special challenge, what we say, but what we hear about Sinai at the uh, Mount Sinai, we should be the Sgulami Kol Hamim, you should be a special treasure, a peculiar treasure for all the nations. We can actually learn how the Tanakh uh, faces Egyptian culture. I trust for a modern uh, orthodox, for, for the modern world to face science, history, and the Bible. That is something very special. And in the Haggadah, we, we learn, shel ben aviv melamdo that the parents, the teachers have to know how to teach their children according to their interests. That is something which should certainly interest, it, which should certainly interest us today. We live in a very open world. We can compare history, we can compare uh, archaeology and science, and to compare it to the Bible, that is a most special challenge. I focused on these, uh, on this field some 25 years ago, and you will find the long paper online. There is a lot of material, meanwhile, that I could find that I added on. These days, I was running from one uh, museum to libraries and other historical institutions connected to experts in the world. Today, we can find much more online. If there is, if there are any new ideas, I would be more. I would be. I would appreciate very much to hear it from you. Now, let's try to go to Egypt. As you can see in the background, uh, it's. We are in Egypt, we see the huge pyramids in Egypt. I want this lecture to be an experience. There will be a lot of sources, a lot of details, and I will not translate and explain all the psukim. You have them here on the presentation, which you can download. You can pick whatever you like as a special example. I think there are a lot. And I will go rather quickly in order to give an overview about the richness of the world in Egypt, and more importantly, how the Bible responds to that. We will talk first about the culture, about the service, the cult to the sun, Ra. We'll talk about the status of Paro, Yosef in Egypt, Moshe in Egypt, some of the Makot, 
and we'll have, we'll have other, other examples which emphasize and illustrate the meaning of uh, Pesach in Yetziat Mitzrayim. Uh, one of the most important uh, symbols in Egypt, religious symbols, is the sun uh, named Ra. The name of the god sun is Ra in Egyptian. Interesting, for the Hebrew ear, Ra means bad. So that's two different an encounter. If you hear the word Ra in Egypt, you worship the sun. If you hear the word Ra in the Bible, it is the worst thing that can happen. And we will see afterwards quite a lot of psukim where, these, uh, where this uh, message is uh, documented very clearly. What you see here in the picture on the left side is the sun with very long arms. The, the arms of the sun, at the end, they have a hand. And they, they, are, they protect the human beings, they protect the king. The king has on his crown a little snake. You see here a serpent between his eyes. His wife is next to him, and she has also this little snake on her, on her head. They are bringing a sacrifice to God with their hands, and the sun has long hands to protect human beings. That's the protection of the sun in the worship of the sun, who, work, who protects the king. The name of these places is called Heliopolis, um, a, a town in Egypt where there was a, a temple for the sun. Helio, sun, polis, the name that's from a later generation. So we see here very typical features of the worship of the sun. The Bible knows to respond to that. Only in the story of Egypt, it says, Hashem will take us out of Egypt he will take us out, Hashem, with a strong and a long, a strong hand and a long arm. That's exactly what you see here, lehavdil, between the term for Hashem, and he will make mishpat, uh, he will make justice to all the, he will punish all the Abu Dazarah in Egypt, all the idolatry. So here we see typical uh, picture of that. Let's go, let's see now in other pictures how these notion is reflected. Yaakov, before, before his death says, Hashem, his angel who saved me from all bad things, should bless these children, and they should continue according to the legacy of our fathers, Avraham and Yitzchak. Mikol Ra? What is Mikol Ra? What does he have in mind? It sounds to me very uh, reasonable that Mikol Ra, all the, all the surrounding uh, Egyptian culture of Avodah Zarah. Furthermore, the Pasuk in Shmot, before Yetziat Mitzrayim, and that Chet Egel at the sin of the calf, of the golden calf, it says, Ki ra'a neget pnechem. Moshe uh, says, don't uh, let Egypt, let Bnei Israel go, because bad things will happen to you. Or at the golden calf, it says, Moshe prays to Hashem, Lama yomru Mitzrayim lemor, bera'a hotzi'am. God took them out of Egypt, if you kill them now, if you now, uh, if, you, if you would now kill the, the Jewish people, Mitzrayim would say, with a bad intention, God took them out of Egypt. It doesn't sound very Hebrew. Rashi, in the name of the Midrash, as you see here on the slide, Rashi says, Midrash Agada Shamati, Kochav Echad Yesh Sheshmo Ra. There is a, a star, part of the Egyptian idolatry. His name is Ra'a. The God took them out of Egypt. Your, your godness, Egyptian godness, took them out to kill them. Hashem says, Moshe, you cannot kill the Jewish people. It would be mis, misunderstood and misinterpreted by the Egyptian culture as a, as a victory of Egypt. Interesting enough that Rashi, the Midrash, had a sensation, had a, had, had a sensitivity for this Midrash for this notion in the Midrash, 
And Ra, the word Ra is not one star in Egypt. It is the biggest god. It's the sun. So I think that these psukim are actually explained very, very meaningfully by understanding the Egyptian background. Let's see now what the sun does in his uh, daily life. There is a so-called solar boat where the king, the sun, or the, the king who is, who is protected by the sun, leaves every morning on a solar boat and crosses the entire heaven from the east to the west and is protecting Egypt during the entire day. That's the solar boat. That is, uh, um, as you can see here, in the picture, the solar boat in the middle is you see the king and he is crossing with the boat, the entire world and the huge snake is beneath him. The king is presented as a strange animal. It looks like a lion. He has a cobra on his head and on his, and the crown is like a huge sun. That is the status of the king. We will talk about these uh, symbols and these motifs later on. Interesting that Yetziat Mitzrayim is described that it happened in the middle of the night. Why is that important at what point in time Yetziat Mitzrayim happened? It says that Kriyat Yamsuf was over the night and in the morning shift, Ashmorat Haboker, Lifnot Boker, all Egyptians who crossed the, the uh, Yamsuf were, were killed were killed there. Why are these indications of the time relevant to the Bible? And based on the Egyptian culture, we can understand that very, very well. The day is the time when the solar boat protects the Egyptian. At night, they are, ex they are exposed. They are more vulnerable. It is exactly at the night, in the middle of the night, that Hashem, who is strong during day and night, will show Egypt that he is the real king. In the morning, when the sun should start his journey in the solar boat, he is not coming because all the Egyptians are dead. That is Pshat Ubechol Elohei Mitzrayim and Seshvatim. God will punish all the, um, all the Abu Dazara, all the, all, the idol, all the idolatry in Egypt. Furthermore, if you look at the solar boat, you will see that there is an eye uh, on the top, and the, uh, on the front, and on the back seat of the king. You see here a huge eye, and here is a huge eye. The king, the sun, the sun of Egypt, the, the, the sun over Egypt is watching over. What you see here, what we hear in the Makat Arbe, that, that there, it says there, Vechisa et Ein Haaretz. They will cover the eye of the earth. What is the eye of earth? We don't understand this notion. It's not found in other places in the Bible. The eye doesn't have, an, the, the earth doesn't have an eye. Unculus already explains that they will cover Ein Shimsha, the eye of the sun. The sun who is watching all Egypt from above will, pro, will all suddenly be covered by the Makat Arbe. Makat Arbe just appears before Makat Choshech, darkness. So before we have to total darkness in Egypt, the shutdown of the sun, the shutdown of the Egyptian idolatry, we have Makat Arbe, they will cover at Ein Haaretz. Nobody is protecting you anymore from your idolatry. Respect and recognize Hashem as a monotheistic God and uh, all the other Avodazara will be punished. So all these details are explained in a very meaningful way. I would like now to show you a Pasuk which didn't deserve too much attention from the Parshanim regarding all very interesting details. And if we look at them carefully, which a certain understanding that there is a meaning to all these, to the uh, Egyptian background, we will get a very, very interesting insight with a much deeper understanding of the meaning of the Yitziat Mitzrayim and of this Pasuk and of the structure of the Seder. Right after 
בני ישראל left Egypt, it says, וידבר השם אל משה לאמור, דבר אל בני ישראל וישובו, ויחנו לפני פי החירות, בין מגדול ובין הים, לפני בעל צפון, ניחחות תחנו על הים. Just when Am Yisrael left Egypt, it says, Hashem told Bnei Yisrael, please return, and you should wait at the place called Pi Achirot, which is between Migdol and the sea, and in front of the name Baal Tzafon. There you should wait before you cross the sea. What, are the, what is the meaning of these names? Obviously, in Egyptian geography, names were not, uh, places were not named according to the Hebrew language. It doesn't make sense. So obviously these names have another message. They want to tell us something about the meaning of, uh, of Yetziat Mitzrayim, and the places for sure had no Hebrew names. They had Egyptian names. Here we have a most fascinating example that there, is, that there are a lot of interesting ways to look at the Torah if you try to understand them from the meaning of Egypt. You don't, we, we shouldn't run away out of Egypt, escape and just run away to get out of there without understanding what's going on. Hashem says, come back for a moment. I want you to wait there between these three places, Piachirot, Migdol and Diam, and there you will see a huge miracle. Hashem tells us it's not just escaping and getting rid of Egypt. It is a process that we are undergoing, and I want you to be there with full awareness. What's the meaning? We should explain. Pi HaChirot is the Hebrew translation of port of freedom. Pi is the mouth or the port of, and Chirot is Chirot, freedom. Pesach is called Chag HaChirot, the, 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 the festivals of freedom. This place like the Statue of Liberty, which has a strong meaning for the new world, has two components. It's on one side, Migdol. Migdol is tower. We know that there were a whole set of towers at the borders of Egypt. Every slave who tried to escape Egypt was caught there or killed there and returned back to Beit Abadim, to the house of slavery in Egypt. So that is one hand, it's the slavery. On the other hand, we have in Egypt another component. It's called Baal Tzafon. The name is Baal Tzafon. Baal is a name of idolatry. Baal, Baal Zavuf. Tzafon is the north. The north is the only direction where the sun has no full control. The sun in the northern hemisphere rises in the east, sunset is in the west, and during daytime it's in the northern hemisphere always a little bit to the south, never in the north. And Egypt, if you think about the geography, is very strong on the eastern, western, and southern borders, is very vulnerable at the northern part, the sea. So if Hashem tells them, come back now, don't run away from Egypt, we will celebrate this historical event between Migdol and Balsafon, Hashem tells us, you are free from slavery, the physical slavery, and you are free from idolatry, the spiritual and religious slavery. That's exactly, these are the two components of freedom. Interestingly enough, when the Mishnah in Psachim says that we should structure our seder by talking about Matchil Begnai, we talk about the shame of Am Yisrael at the beginning, and at the end we come to the glory, the Talmud says, in two names, uh, opinions by the Amoraim, Rav and Shmuel, what is the beginning of Gnai? One says, and the other says, one says it was slavery, physical slavery, and the other one, it says it was idolatry, spiritual, religious slavery. The Yerushalmi says, it's not a machloket, these are not two different opinions, there are two opinions and both are accepted and we know that we have both in the Seder. So the Seder reflects exactly the double feature of Yetziat Mitzrayim. Freedom means physically and freedom means spiritual freedom. We see that in the Pasuk, if we look at it carefully, and that's a very, very 
authentic explanation to the Pasuk, which wouldn't have any other meaning, these Pasukim are left by the Mephoshim without any uh, understanding. And I think with these in insights, we find an extremely, extremely meaningful message at the time of Egypt, not at the time of the Haggadah, many, many generations later, already at the time of the liberation from Egypt, Hashem tells us, remember, freedom has two components. You are no slaves anymore, and you are not in prison anymore in Egypt on one hand, and you are not committed to the Avodah Zarah, to the idolatry in Egypt on the other hand. I want to show you now a few pictures which are, in my opinion, fascinating that we see actually Psukim. When they left Egypt, it says that there were Egypt were uh, uh, the king and all his uh, army were running after Am Yisrael. And at that point in time, when the wheels were were uh, broke, Am Yisrael realized uh, Egypt realized. They said, we should run away from, Hashem, from Am Yisrael because Hashem is fighting for them. You see here the king in the war is trying to conquer his enemies. He kills his enemies and he holds in his hand a symbol, a religious symbol. On his head, you see the symbol of the sun. If Bnei Yisrael were capable to run away and all his wheels were broken that's exactly what reflects the Egyptian understanding of war here we see very very fascinating pictures of um, of uh, a cow and uh, the Egyptian they worship the cow as a symbol of fertility and they bring even to the calf they bring a, a sacrifice to the calf. You see here the king who brings a sacrifice to the calf and his, his entire team follow to worship the calf. The, the, the bulls and cows in Egypt, of course, were the symbol both for fertility, milk, work in the fields, extremely important symbol. And if we look afterwards in the, we, uh, at the story, of the golden calf, it says there very clearly what happened to Am Yisrael that they were standing by Har Sinai, listening at Har Sinai Mount, at Mount Sinai. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Hashem Rotzei Ticha Meretz Mitzrayim Mibeit Avadim. Hashem identifies himself. I took you out of Egypt, but Bnei Israel were taken out of Egypt, but Egypt was still deep inside in the awareness of Bnei Israel. And instead of respecting and accepting Matan Torah, they started to build the golden calf. Why? In Yirmiyahu, it says that Egypt is compared to a Egla Yefeifia Mitzrayim, the beautiful uh, calf uh, is the symbol for Mitzrayim. The symbol of Mitzrayim was working at the Nile working at the, um, on the fields and having a, str a, a strong uh, agricultural independence. That was exactly what Am Yisrael were thinking about when they were in the desert. Where are we? We are lost in the desert. So they were thinking about these agricultural motifs in Egypt. It's the golden calf. And that's what they did. If you look now at the, at the Psukim at, at, in uh, it says Moshe came down, sorry, that they asked Aharon, the priest, to prepare these idolatries, to prepare these cult. And afterwards, Moshe saw, Vayar Moshe et Ha'am, ki faruahu, Aharon, ki ferao Aharon le shintza, kamehem. It says here at Matan Torah, a very strange wording, Moshe saw that the people is parua ki farao Aharon l'shinza. He saw them; they were running wild. Aharon had let them get out of control. What does it mean? Get out of control? Paruahu, farao. The wording of parua and farao is exactly parao. 
they are still connected to Paro instead of being connected to Moshe and to, uh, and to Hashem. So the wording here reflects something very Egyptian. They left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave their mind. Here you see the cow, the king in his solar boat worships the cow. And a lot of people from his, uh, from his team, from the royal team, worship the cow, another solo boat, and there's a, a, a high respect to the cow because the cow will bring uh, independence, agricultural, eco economic independence. Let's move now forward to another topic of Yetziat uh, Mitzrayim. It's the house, Bait. Paro, the translation of Paro is the big house. When Yosef was in Egypt, he was successful at the palace of Paro, in his house. Hashem blessed the house of, of Paro. And he was doing everything. Nobody was bigger in his house. In the house of Paro is the biggest house in Egypt. The palace is not only the king's place. There were no other big homes. Only Paro had a home. Uh, and interesting enough, the Meyaldot, the, the ladies who helped at the midwives, who helped at the birth of Am Yisrael, instead of killing them, they actually protected them. Instead of throwing him, them to the, to, to the river, they saved them, and Hashem gave them a special um, acknowledgement. Vayas lahem batim. Hashem gave the midwives batim. Batim means they had a status of better people. They have a status of the higher society. Not out, not sleeping outside. They were sleeping, they had their own homes. It's a status of independence and of respect. Let's see now what it says at Yetziat Mitzrayim just before. The sacrifice that Am Yisrael had to do, they had to protect their homes. Probably simple tents or very simple buildings, if at all they had something. It, Hashem wanted them to go to their families. There were huge homes in Egypt, big batim, the pyramids. Hashem says, no, I don't want the pyramids to be the center. I want your home, your family to be the center. You bring a korban, you bring one, every bayit has his own, her own status, its own holiness. That's the beginning of Yetziat Mitzrayim. Not leaving. Before you leave, you have to know who you are. Who is your father? Who are your parents? What is your home? That is the message of Yetziat Mitzrayim. That's exactly what we do uh, in the Haggadah. We sit, the parents, the older generation, tell the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim. The children ask, and there is a dialogue be between generation and generation. It is the Jewish home which is the center piece of Yetziat Mitzrayim. It's not the huge home which Paul built where we were slaves to build for him all these huge buildings, the pyramids who are impressive till these very days. That is the message of the Torah. The real Bait is what we have, the Jewish home, not the Bait, not these huge buildings in Egypt. Here in this picture, I want to move on now to tell a few details about Yosef in Egypt. We go now chronologically to some extent and we'll cover different topics from Yosef, Moshe, Yetziat Mitzrayim and afterwards to talk about uh, the meaning of Egyptology and Tanakh. What you see here in this very impressive picture is you see seven cows and one bullet in the left lower corner. As you see from his horns and here, there are seven cows. The seven cows are the symbol of fertility in Egypt. And a lot of worship, I can't read all the text, but from the explanation it says, they bring them sacrifice and pray that uh, fertility in Egypt will be blessed. These are seven cows. That's exactly what Paul was dreaming. He was dreaming at night about seven fat pot and thin pot and thin one were swallowing the big pot, the big cows. That's a symbol of Egypt, a classical motif told to us in the story of Yosef. Interesting enough, in one of the commentators, I saw uh, that Shana, 
is the is the Egyptian word for cow, Shana. Yosef was translating the word Shana, seven cows, seven, 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 Shana. Shana in Hebrew means a year. So it was very, very easy for him to understand, it was evident to understand that the seven Shana, the seven Parot in Egypt, are seven years, Sheva Shanim. So that's a very interesting explanation that for Yosef, by keeping his Hebrew identity and talking primarily to himself, he had nobody else to talk Hebrew to, when he spoke to himself and translated these words in Egyptian, Shana, he actually understood what is the meaning of the dreams. That makes it very realistic to understand these uh, motifs. I just want to draw your attention to these two pictures you see here on the upper part, a hornet, and here we see the, the, the reed, a symbol of reed. We will talk about, that, uh, about these two topics later on. Here you see when, we, when, when uh, Yosef was appointed to be the Mishne Lamelech, the second person in the, in the uh, royal court in Egypt, he got uh, a ring, as you see here, and he got a revit, special ornaments. That's exactly what is described in the Torah as an appointment. Here we have an interesting finding, description, how, how Yosef was appointed. Pao told him, you, nobody else should be like you, only, only myself. Pao called Yosef Tsofnat Pa'aneach. What does that mean? Why does he call Yosef with the Egyptian name? Tsofnat is the hidden place, as we, told, as we explained before. Never the sun is in the north. The, the north is hidden from the sun, is unknown, is not controlled. Panach is the long, Anach is the long hand from the sun who will protect human beings, the king, Egypt. So Yosef is the guy who was capable to connect to the hidden. Panach, to decipher, to decipher the hidden aspects uh, of Paro's dreams of the sun. It's not known to the sun what happens in the north because it's not the place where the sun really stands. But Paro, he actually did get there. That's the meaning of the name Tsofnat Paner. And he got to have a good yichus. He got as a wife uh, Osnat, and she was the, the daughter of the priest to the sun, Kohen On. On is the name of the, of the, of, of the sun god. Vayetze Yosef, as we know from Yecheskel. Vayetze Heliopolis is the, is the city of the sun. Vayetze Yosef al Eretz Mitzrayim. What's the, what's the meaning of this expression? Yosef went out over all Egypt. Yes, normally people explain his fame was all over Egypt, but that's not the meaning of the word. Benno Jacob says, Yosef Latzet Al is mentioned in the Bible only twice, in the Torah only twice. Hashemesh Yatza Al Haaretz. It's only mentioned in another place on the sun. The sun was rising and the sunrise was over the entire world. If it says in the, at the appointment of Yosef, Yosef al Eretz Mitzrayim, it means he was in an analogy compared to the sun. He was as famous and as powerful as the sun. Latzet al means to be to uh, to rise over the over the earth like the sun. And here we have exactly the pictures how a king is appointed. The sun, at the time of the appointment, the sun rises, the sun shines over him and over the, all the other gods which appoint him to be the king. Furthermore, his face, the color with gold, have the same uh, shape of the sun as you can see on the picture here. 
So it is a very, very interesting and, and special observation if it says, Vayetzei Yosef al Eretz Mitzrayim, that means Yosef was like a sunny boy. Uh, he was the most important, uh, he achieved the most important stature in Egypt. He was like a son, comparable only to Paul. Let's look now how Yosef wanted to consider himself, how, Mos how Yosef wanted to be remembered for the future by his nation, by his, uh, by, by Am Yisrael. The cult of the death in Egypt was very developed. As we know from the mummifications, till these days we can see bodies of Egyptian kings 3,000 years ago. Do we see the huge buildings, the pyramids of the, of the king after their death? Yosef had a clear understanding about these cultural traditions. But he had a totally different message. As you can see here, a huge um, building, a huge uh, symbol of a king in Egypt. Yosef had a totally different message which he wanted to leave for his children and for Am Yisrael. Before he died, he said, don't bury me in Egypt, as everybody else would have done. Don't leave me in Egypt as a symbol for Egyptian history. Bring me, leave me here till we come back to Eretz Israel. Leave me here in the Aron till I can be brought back, my bones can be brought back to Eretz Israel. Vayisem ba'aron mimitzrayim. The Midrash in Sota Yud Gimel says that there were two Aronot. There was an Aron Shil Kodesh Bochu, Aron Hashem, Aron Abrit, and there was an Aron, the coffin of Yosef, which followed Am Yisrael from Egypt to Eretz Yisrael. That was his message. He wants to walk with them the way from Egypt to Eretz Yisrael. He doesn't want to be a symbol in Egypt for Egyptian tradition and Egyptian history. He wants to be part of Am Yisrael, and the message is, you bring me back to Eretz Yisrael. Therefore, it says, at the time of the Yetziat Mitzrayim, the most important cultural uh, object or the cultural uh, message that Moshe was dealing with as these days, running out with the uh, Am Yisrael from Egypt, yes, but he has to take with himself, he has to take with him and with Am Yisrael the bones of Yosef because Am Yisrael was, uh, promised him that at the time of Yetziat Mitzrayim, he will follow. Considering the very, very developed cult of death uh, of, uh, in Egypt, that is an unbelievable, mean, uh, uh, unbelievable message that Yosef wanted to leave with Am Yisrael back to Eretz Yisrael, and he was leading them during the journey of Yetziat Mitzrayim. Now let's take a look at some stories of Moshe in Egypt. All boys should be killed by throwing them to the river, to the Nile. Nile. Interesting, there are many, way, many ways to kill a baby at birth. Why to throw them to the Yeol? And of course, the Yeol is the symbol, another source of fertility in Egypt. All the water in the desert comes from the uh, Yeol. The Yeol on the, on the big river has two sides. This, the river side is called Meitzal. In uh, Aramit, Dina de Bar Matzra, Meitzal is one, are the two sides of the river. All Egypt is called Mitzrayim, the, the eastern and western part side of the river. So if they, had, should have, if they should be killed at birth, it's not kill them right away after birth. It is throw them to the river because the Egyptian river will tell Am Yisrael we are stronger and, and Egypt is, strong, is uh, much stronger than the, the, than the birth of uh, Jewish children. Yochevet tried to hide him, but after three, three months, it was too difficult for her. Vatitz Penehu Shlosha Yerachim Velo Yachla Od 
at spino. She couldn't hide him anymore. Normally, to hide in Hebrew is said, what, what does the word tzafon mean, mean here? As we, as we just explained before, tzafon is the north where the sun will never get. It's the vulnerable part. So Yocheved had a very good sense of humor in these difficult days to protect Moshe, her baby, from God, the Egyptian God, the Egyptian idolatry of the sun. She was hiding him, taking him away from the sun. She put him in the north. But Titzpenel, that's the meaning she was hiding him. Instead of letting the Yeol kill her child, Khalila, she used the Yeol to save, to protect her child. And she puts him in the reed. Vatasim basuf als fata yeol. And when Moshe got bigger and the daughter of Paro found the baby from the Egyptian culture to see a baby in the reed of the river, that's, of course, an absolutely clear message. Oh, he is sent from us, from God. The Nile, the, the Yeo is the symbol of Egyptian agriculture, economy, religious traditions come from the river. So Yocheved was successful to transform the killing power of the, of the river to the saving process. He was saved according to the Egyptian culture. And she brought him as a present for her. Moshe was named Moshe during his whole career because he was, the, he was the baby who was a present from the river for Egypt, for Am Yisrael, and for the entire world. We have beautiful psukim in Sefer Yeshayahu, which were explained in this sense by Professor Elitsu, and I'll just refer to it. There are a lot of very interesting insights we can learn from this paper. We come now to a motif, which is a very, very fascinating, interesting, in my opinion, a very convincing one, and has a lot of meanings for Yetziat Mitzvah. When Hashem sent Moshe to Paro, he told him, what do you have in your hand? You have a stick, throw it on the floor, it will be a snake, a serpent. And he went to Pharao, and he could, his snake could swallow all the snakes in Egypt. Interesting that the Egyptian, according to the Torah, were capable to transform a snake to the stick, and vice versa, the stick to the snake. And I, I was always asking the question, how is that possible that the Egyptians were also capable to do so? I'm not asking a question about how Moshe could do it. It's a miracle we believe in the Torah. But how were the Egyptians capable to do so? And the Mate of Aaron swallowed all their sticks. So obviously, there must be an explanation. Otherwise, these questions uh, are not resolved and leave a very, a, very big a very big question. How was it possible that the Egyptian did the same? And here we find that Pao called his Chachamim and Mechashvim, all his magicians. How was that possible? And the explanation already described in the late 19th century by German researchers who came to Egypt, Ehrman and many others, and they described that till these days, there were Egyptian magicians who knew how to, how to take a cobra, and the cobra has a lot of muscular, circular muscles about, surrounding his neck. If the, if the cobra wants to attack with the poison, he sits like that and waits, and when he attacks, he, stra he straightens uh, his neck and he attacks. If he is um, attacking, he, uh, the magicians knew how to press between the two vertebral bodies and press on the spinal cord of the nervous system of the snake, not killing him totally, but strong presser, pressure. By, by, by doing this strong pressure, on the, bike, on the uh, spinal cord, the snake entered a, a, a tonic status 
of his entire body. He couldn't move anymore. He was stick. He was like a stick. Now this trick explains very, very well what, uh, the, what happened in the Tanakh. Moshe came with his real Mate Elohim, which turned to be a, uh, a snake. But whatever the Chartumim did was only a, a magic, the classical Egyptian magic. A magician in the Tanakh is called Menachashim, a guy who knows how to play with snakes. We are aware about this culture that snakes are an object for, for, for magics. Now we understand the symbol that in Yechezkel, uh, Paro is described according to his own description. I'm like a big snake in the Yeol, and he, the Paro says about himself, Li Yeol v'ani asitimi. I'm the owner of this big river, and I, I'm self-made. That, that was the understanding of Paro. I'm the powerful guy in Egypt. I'm the owner of Egypt. I'm the big snake in the river. And I will attack anybody who, who, who is trying to attack me. Here we have the message that the stick of Paro that is encountered by the Mate Elohim, who is also a Nachash, and he will swallow them all. That is a very, very meaningful message for Mitzrayim. Here we see four different kings or godnesses in Egypt, and everybody has his own kind of a stick with different symbols, which seem to be very, very meaningful messages in Egypt, and Moshe swallowed them, Moshe's stick swallowed them all. all. It was like the, the staff, it was like the, the, the whole team that Moshe, the whole team of Egypt, which were swallowed by the, by the Nachash, the snake of Moshe, and it turned to be Mate Elohim. You see here that only the, only the king was allowed to hold the stick in his hands, and only his son, because he will be the successor. Nobody else was allowed to appear with a stick at the palace. Now, interesting enough that if we, if we read the miracles at the Shlichut, the mission of Moshe, Shlach Yadcha Vechoz Biznavo, Vayehi Lemate Bechapo, he had a hole, he had his mate, and his mate, and the Nachash turned to be a mate. That is a very interesting meaning. On one hand, there is a stick in Egypt, and there, there are Nachashim, snakes. They are connected. Because by turning, by having control over the, over the snakes, the idolatry, that is his stick, it's his power. We will see that in a moment. Rav Kook, who was not dealing, who was not researching the, the history and the Egyptological messages, he made a very interesting comment that that is exactly the power of Moshe. He knew how to deal with the idolatry in Egypt, but to turn it, to transform it to the Mate Elohim. This interesting comment by Rav Kook is actually presented in wonderful pictures which I got from Professor Otmar Kehl when I was researching these topics. What you see here is the king sitting in the middle. He is the only person who sits. He has a big stick in his hands and has three crowns. The other king who appears in front of him has only two. The whole picture is divided by a huge snake to two different parts. The upper part where you see the king and the lower part where people are in prison. You see here slaves in prison, a big uh, nesher above that, and you see the whole, um, uh, and you see a snake, a cobra, protecting the world under the big snake below that. But look what we have here at the end. We have at the end here, on the back of the king, is a guy who is backing him. The guy who backs him is, holds two sticks in his hands. But these sticks, they're not straight. These are actually snakes. They are thicker at the top part here. That's the head of the snake. And you see the snakes who obviously just had to under, underwent this procedure of pressure to their neck between the, verte between the 
vertebral bodies and they're in, in a stiffness. That is the symbol, that's the way he was having backing the king by Khartoumim, Chachamim, who knew how to bring this, the, these snakes here. He holds a stick and nobody else was allowed to appear there. If you don't follow these rules of the sticks, you will land here at the cobra. You see it here very nicely. You will land here. And here's another picture who illustrates that very, very nicely. You see here also the dogs who are protecting the king, who are protecting the palace of Egypt uh, uh, here. Here another picture. The king has a stick in his hand, a snake. And with this snake, he is in his solar boat. And a huge snake is protecting him. And he goes all over Egypt to, to, to be the king of Egypt with his snake and the symbol of the sun. Let's look here from the Makot at the notion that Bnei Israel were very fruitful. Why is the Jewish people compared here to these animals? And the answer comes if we understand what's the meaning of the frogs in Egypt kind of a shedetz. It says about the, the Tzfardim, the frogs, when they came out of the river, the Sharatz Hayeol Tzfardim. Why? Because the frogs were a symbol of fertility. When the woman gave birth, they hold a, a bone, that they hold stones in their hands at the shape of frogs, and these uh, frogs were the symbol, we should be fruitful like frogs. If it says, for Am Yisrael, Huvnei Yisrael, Paru, that is added according to the Egyptian terminology. What is, well, what is fertility? To be like a Shedetz. Let's move to Har Sinai. At Har Sinai, we know that Am Yisrael, the 12 Shvatim, were standing in front of Har Sinai to accept Matan Torah. Here we see a king who has 12 priests and 12 soldiers, six in front of him and six behind him, who are, who are carrying him around, and the big dog is here, and uh, uh, Eagle is giving his ring to the king. These are the motifs which are familiar from Har Sinai. Hashem brought us to Har Sinai by Esayetchem al kanfei Nesharim. I bring you on the wings of Eagle to Har Sinai. And Amis Hashem says, Am Yisrael, I'm God who took you out of Egypt. So that is a, like a deja vu of Egyptian culture for Am Yisrael, but now it is true. You are free, you are not in Egypt anymore. Let's move now to a very interesting motif after Yetziat Mitzrayim, after Matan Torah, and it is uh, in Parshat Mishpatim, where it says, Hashem says, V'shalachti et hatzir alefanecha. I will send a hornet in front of you and they will expel from you. I will not expel them in one year, otherwise there will be a disaster for the land. Slowly, very slowly, I will expel them from you and you should come to Eretz Yisrael and be successful there. This, this, um, the Tzira is mentioned in Sefer Tvarim and in Sefer Yehoshua as well, both in the context that Hashem will uh, expel and weaken other nations in Eretz Yisrael, so you can come into Eretz Yisrael lo velo without war. What is the meaning of this tzira? The Mefarshim, Chazal, and the Parshanim do not provide any, any explanation, certainly not something that is convincing and gives a, a full explanation for this tzira. Here we have a finding from an Egyptian uh, uh, finding. It shows a gravestone of one of the kings. You see on the top the whole, the huge eagle, with underneath him are seven slaves. There were seven neighbors, seven na na nations in the na uh, around Egypt, and the, the seven nations, like Sheba, the seven nations in Eretz Israel. Uh, Egypt 
try to take control over all of them. And you see here the king with his horse and with his army. On the left and right side, they are conquering buildings, big towers, and here you see how they are fighting. In the middle is a huge hornet. What's the meaning of this hornet? Hornet is a small animal, very fast, very aggressive, and very dangerous. If a hornet attacks, it can be very dangerous and it can result in death. That was the symbol of the kings after Yosef, Yosef, a very aggressive politic, a very Egypt-oriented uh, approach of their political uh, uh, goals compared to the generation beforehand at the time of Yosef when the king was open for foreigners. At that time, the symbol is the hornet. You attack others, you control others, and you kill others. That is the enemy, the dangerous Egypt. Now let's take a look at other pictures where you, where you see the king, the young king was appointed, and you see here the symbol of the hornet, and you see the reed here. The same you see here on this side. And you see a big dog who is protecting uh, the king, watching the king, and you see the king has all his enemies under his stick, under his staff here. They're all controlled by him. That is the hornet, is the strong power. Let's now read again the Pasuk, and we see how meaningful insights this historical background about the hornet as a symbol for the aggressive politics in Egypt at the time of Yosef, at, after the time of Yosef, at the time of Yetziat Mitzrayim, gives to understand the Pasuk. I will send the hornet in front of you. Egypt was fighting against the enemies. It is a very short uh, journey from Egypt to Eretz Israel. If we go right away through the western part of Egypt, through the desert. And here they were fighting. During 40 years, there was a war of attrition between Egypt and the neighbors. And Yoshua Knaan were fighting during 40 years against protecting themselves from Egypt. That was a very, very exhausting period over many years, just after the Yetziat Mitzrayim. Bnei Israel should not be on this um, on, on this place. They they took a right turn down to Har Sinai. They got the Torah and they were learning in the yeshiva, Har Sinai for forty years. After forty years, they came into Eretz Yisrael from the back door, from Yericho, from the eastern part of Eretz Yisrael. While Egypt was fighting for a long war of attrition with Yoshev uh, Knan, Bnei Israel entered from the backside. That's the pshat in the Pasuk. Hashem says just six Pesukim earlier, Im shamoa tishma bekolo v'asita kol asher adaber, v'ayavti et oivecha, v'tzarti et zorarecha. Hashem says that I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you. What is the pshat? What is meant by these psukim? That is exactly the tzir'ah. Egypt, who wanted to kill you, Egypt will continue to fight, not against you. Egypt will continue to fight about your next enemies in Eretz Yisrael. And you will enter from the back door and Hashem is, will send the, the tzira in front of you. Your, your enemy will be a, your enemy who kills, you will be your friend who kills another enemy. That's a beautiful example both to understand the Pasuk and not, and even more importantly, to understand Hashkacham, that Hashem, how he leads Am Yisrael, from Egypt to Eretz Yisrael by giving them help from the Egyptians to kill them. Let's come down to the last, to the last topic, which is Kvedut Halev Shel Paro. Uh, Paro was very stubborn, and it says he, had a, he, put, he, he was himself stubborn, and afterwards Hashem gave him a very 
hard, heavy heart. And very, very often in Yetziat Mitzrayim, the notion of kvat lev, of kshe lev, lechazik, lechazik et libo, is mentioned along the ten makot. At the beginning, it is Paro, who made his own heart, his own heart very hard and stubborn, and later on it was Hashem. Nachama Leibovitch points out very nicely that that is the nature of human behavior. At the beginning, you choose a way to be stubborn, and at the end, Hashem, you are just the victim of your own decision. So it's not that he lost his free decision, he decided that he wants to be stubborn, so his left, his heart got harder and harder. But what is this concept of Hachbet Lev, which is mentioned so often in Egypt? If we go to, if we look at the Egyptian tradition, and we can find a lot of fascinating pictures in Google when you search for weighing of the heart in ancient Egypt, with very, very interesting explanations, that is part of the cult of the death in Egypt. A king was described after his death for the future generations for Egyptian history up to these very days, whether he was a good king, a successful king, or a bad king. As you can see, the pyramids, these are the, the, these are the proof for many generations, for hundreds and thousands of years, about the power of these kings. What they did when they prepared the, the when they mummified, uh, when they em embalmed the bodies of the king, there was a cult. They took out all the organs, and one of the organs, the heart, was weight. And if he was a bad king, they decided, oh, his heart was very was very heavy. If he was a good king, they decided he was an easygoing guy, a, a very very. Uh, Easy, a, a light heart for everybody. So weighing of the heart is a classical concept of Egyptian tradition. How do you describe the king for nations to come? You see that on the pictures here. You see how this cult was uh, done by the next king. And you see all the writers here who write history, whether he had a heavy heart or he had an easygoing heart. You see the pictures here beautiful paintings. It was obviously a very important uh, cult for the history in Egypt. And you see how many people were present when they were waiting his heart. And now we come to a most amazing comparison. What is the heavy heart for the Bible? And what's the heavy heart in Egypt? In Egypt, the heavy heart is that after your death, after the death of the king, the nation will decide the next king will decide whether he was a good guy, his whole, his whole palace, the culture will decide after his death whether he was good or bad. The Torah says something very similar, but totally different. You, Paro, decide now and here whether you want to have a heart, a, 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 a stiff heart, a heart, a heavy heart, or whether you want to be, you went to go in history because you gave Am Yisrael liberty to leave freedom, to leave Egypt, not to be any enemies, not to be slaves anymore. That is the huge difference. The Torah says you have the choice and now you will decide today how you will be described in the history for future generations. Whatever your buildings are, the pyramids in Egypt, as much as you think they're very impressive and powerful, the Torah says no. You will, be, you will enter history if your heart is a good heart, an easy heart for slaves and justice for all human beings. That's the message of Yitziat Mitzrayim leaving Beit Abadi. I trust that is an amazing message, which is relevant, both interesting, both historically, 3,000 years ago, and didn't, it didn't lose uh, the power of the message, didn't lose the meaning at all, till these very days. I summarize, I tried to give you a taste of this beautiful work of comparing the Torah, the world of Egypt, as one of the most fascinating cultures of the ancient world, and to see how the Torah compares, responds to these concepts and messages 
of ancient e uh, of ancient ancient Egypt. I hope that was at least a little insight. We can dig deeper in the history and in the Torah, and the encounter, the combination of these two worlds, has such a wonderful meaning that I think it should actually be mentioned, taught, and mentioned at every seder to understand the meaning of Yetziat Mitzayim, followed by all other explanations. As you see, the website has all the materials. You can find there whatever we presented now. And I would be more than happy if you have questions or suggestions or further insight to Yetziat Mitzayim that we can add here on more and more. I hope this ads will make a contribution for your understanding and your own experience. The Mishnah says in every generation, a person has to see himself as if he left Egypt. The Rambam reads, Everybody should show himself he left Egypt. And that's what I tried to accomplish here by showing you the beauty of the history in Egypt. But the real beauty comes if we read this history with the eyes of the Tanakh and with the eyes of Yetziat Mitzrayim. Thank you very much for your attention. Chak, Kasher, Vesamech.